Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Try to introduce in a sense already that Paul is filled with great joy, and he's very proud of the situation of what is going on in the church in Thessalonica. Uh, to set the stage a little bit for his thanksgiving and his joy, uh, I want to share a couple verses from chapter 3. Uh, he says, We sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. Uh, Paul kind of sets the stage that he was in a state of worry about the people in Thessalonica. Why? Because he wasn't there very long. The seeds were planted, faith was growing, and then persecution came, and he was actually driven from the city. And as persecution for the believers of God is spreading about, uh, he is very concerned. He's worried that maybe the seed might be falling on soil, like rocky soil. It's growing up, right? But now the pressure's are coming in. And so he said, for this reason, I, I was so worried and I couldn't stand it any longer. So I sent someone to find out about where you were, how your faith was. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. I don't think here that's self-serving, right? I just wanted to make sure that my work, <laughs> right, didn't... Uh, no, he's concerned that um, the faith that was there that he took great joy in, uh, that it might not be present any longer because of the work of the tempter. So he's overjoyed to find that indeed, amongst them, the Word of God has had its effect. So much so, right, that uh, there is even a report moving throughout the region about how these people in Thessalonica, by the power of God's Word, they are those who have turned to God from idols, and they serve the living and true God. In some ways, it's almost kind of the opposite picture of what we see Moses go through, right? The living God had led his people out of Egypt. He had led them through the Red Sea, and Moses goes up on the mountain, uh, and God delivers his commandments uh, for his people, and he finds out that the people have turned from the living God to worship an idol. You imagine the joy. See, this is the worry that Paul is under, but what great joy to find. No, indeed, as many as there are idols all around his people, because of the powerful work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, through that word, that his people had turned away from idols. And they had worshipped the living God. And Jesus, whom he sent. Why are they doing this? Well, it is that work of the Lord. Paul talks about how this word came to them, not just as a word, but also with power and the work of the Holy Spirit. And when they received it, they were like Paul, and that they received this word in the midst of their great affliction, they received it with joy by the work of the Holy Spirit. And not only that, this word that they received in joy, this word of the Lord has now also sounded forth from them. And so yes, in this beginning, he is proud of them, but at the same time, uh, he is really kind of pushing the glory towards the word of the Lord. The work of the word has borne fruit amongst them. And to this he finds great delight. Um, I have the pleasure right now to be able to attend class just as dad. Um, this last week got to go uh, uh, for learning about the commandments uh, with one of my, ch uh, a child of mine. And uh, while we were there, uh, we were learning about the third commandment. Uh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Just as Paul holds forth the amazing power of the Word, um, also we learn that ultimately this is our hope. This is what we cling to. We hold it sacred and learn it. Uh, a couple weeks back, we were talking about the first commandment. We, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things, and how this runs through all the commandments. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, as pastors, sometimes... Uh, we get a little obsessed with the third commandment, um, partly because it's kind of visible, um, and we sort of see many times where there's idolatry, 
right? Um, uh, Paul took great delight in the Thessalonians uh, turning from idols, right, to worship the living God. And uh, oftentimes we see related to the third commandment where people sometimes get uh, kind of caught up with idols. Now we have to be careful because sometimes that's a visible idolatry. Um, but, you know, you get the fourth commandment, the fifth commandment, the sixth commandment. Sometimes idolatry is a little bit hidden. And you don't always know where my idolatry lies. Um, well, pastor has to be here because he has to be here. Right? Um, but the question is, do we hold God's Word to be sacred? Now, occasionally I've heard this taught where, you know, it's not really about having to be at church, right? Because it talks about our attitude towards God's Word, right? And so as long as I don't have an attitude of despising towards God's Word, or as long as I kind of say I love God's Word, uh, then I've obeyed the third commandment. Um, this might be a little bit of a strong law sermon, um, uh, but I think hopefully at the end we see it's the work of God that brings us to repentance. In the large catechism, Martin Luther explains more deeply what he means in the small catechism. So, however, since the masses of people cannot attend every day, there must be at least one day in the week set apart. Now, we could almost just stop there, right? Uh, Martin Luther would love that we held the Word of God in such esteem, right, that we would uh, be in church every day, uh, but he knows that's not practical. Uh, we have jobs, and we have work to do, and so there should be one day of the week that's set apart. Set apart, we individually set it apart. Uh, I think he also means as a society, in a sense, they set it apart. Uh, he would probably go to the elector and say, hey, we got too much stuff going on on Sunday. From ancient times, Sunday, the Lord's Day, has been appointed for this purpose. So we also should continue to do the same, nor that everything may be done in an orderly way. Why does he bring up the Word of God? Well, we need the Word of God. That's why it's set apart. So much depends on God's Word. Without it, no holy day can be sanctified. Therefore, we must know that God insists on the strict observance of this commandment, and he will punish all who despise his Word and are not willing to hear and learn it, especially at the time appointed for the purpose. So occasionally you might say, well, I shouldn't despise preaching in his word. Well, as long as I have a good attitude. That's not what he's saying. He's saying to despise would be to neglect the appointed time for the purpose of the word of God. It is not only the people who greatly misuse it and desecrate the holy day who sin against this commandment, those who neglect to hear God's word because of their greed, they want to work and make money rather than honor God and His Word. Or frivolity, they want to have sport and play and hobby. Or those who are torn down by their sinful behavior, who lie in taverns and are dead drunk like swine. But then he pushes even on the crowd here today, right? But even that other crowd sins. They listened to God's word like it was only was any other trifle and only come to preaching because of custom. They go away again, and at the end of the year, they know as little of God's word as at the beginning. Up to this point, the opinion prevailed that you had properly hallowed Sunday when you had heard a mass or the gospel read. You got your body in the pew, but no one cared for God's word, and no one taught it. Now that we have God's Word, we fail to correct the abuse. We allow ourselves to be preached to and admonished, but we do not really listen care seriously and carefully. Know, therefore, that you must be concerned, not only about hearing, but also about learning and retaining God's Word in memory. Do not think that this is optional for you or of no great importance. Think that it is God's commandment who will require an account from you about how you have heard and learned and honored his word. I think I maybe have used this example once before, but uh, I had a secretary at my last church who was Roman Catholic, and she said to me once, well, you Lutherans don't believe it's a sin to miss church. And I said, yeah, we do. <laughs> Martin Luther says that. 
But we understand it's more than that, right? Uh, and there are reasons why maybe I can't attend church. Uh, maybe I got COVID. Everything in my heart would want to be here. I'd want to be at church. I'd want to hear his word. But uh, because of that, I wouldn't be able to be here. Or we have shut-ins, right, who are not able to come and hear God's word. And so we don't understand it necessarily in just a, a, a legalistic sense. But uh, if I uh, have idols, right, things that I place in front of God, indeed to neglect his word is a sin. And I am held account for how I heard, learned and honored his word. He said, you don't think it's a sin? I said, yeah, we do. Absolutely we do. Remembering the Sabbath day is to not despise preaching in his word, holding it sacred, gladly hearing and learning it. We found that Paul was proud. He was proud of how the people viewed the word of God. They viewed it as something by the work of the Holy Spirit to be received with joy, something to also be received but also shared and proclaimed. And how they handled the Word of God indeed brought forth growth and joy that Paul was deeply proud of. Last week, uh, we had confirmation service. There was a little bit of a, a tinge of me that struggled with how we had to do confirmation this year. We had to make it a family affair, right? Just a family as in biological family, right? Um, and, and confirmation is a church celebration. And so it was a little bit odd to not celebrate confirmation amongst the broader church. Um, Because confirmation is all about the confirming work of the Holy Spirit through His Word. That which which God gave in baptism, the Holy Spirit by His Word, confirming and making that true for us uh, today. And so I always think, in a sense, as a church, even as kids are uh, stating their faith, we're reaffirming our faith. Because if we no longer... Uh, are confirmed. We no longer believe those promises uh, that those kids make. If we can't also make them, then in a sense, it doesn't matter if you had a ceremony long ago. You'd no longer be confirmed. So the kids proclaim these things, and in a sense, maybe we affirm them again today. Uh, Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? And they say, I do. Do you intend to hear the Word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? I do by the grace of God. Um, I don't know if you've always catch that in that service, why we make those kind of different pronouncements. One seems to be kind of a faith, a belief type of thing. Something that I say, hey, that's true. And the other is my actions in response. And uh, I'd almost say the first one could have by the grace of God too. We believe that. I can't believe God's Word is inspired, but by the grace and work of the Holy Spirit uh, in my life. Um, But also, I definitely can't live by that, except by the grace of God and the work of the Word itself. But I'd also say, let's not pull those two things apart too much either, right? There's a reason why we have them say it that way. But if I don't hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully, am I really believing it's the inspired word of God? Or if I do believe it's the inspired word of God, would I not (laughs) hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Our actions and our beliefs cannot really ultimately be separated. So here's the good news for us. God's Word works. Why does the law come down upon us to remind us to value and hold precious, to gladly hear and hold fast to the Word of God and diligently apply ourselves, not just on the day appointed, but daily in our lives around God's Word? Why are we moved towards those things? Because the Word of God works repentance. It's the good news of God and the work of His precious Word that moves us from idolatry towards the living God. Idolatry in how we spend our time. uh, Idolatry in our thoughts and actions across all of God's commandments. 
Why is Paul proud? Because the word of God had worked in God's people that they had turned. No, they didn't do what the Israelites did, turning from the living God to worship idols. No, the word of God moved them to turn from idols to the living and true God. And that now their whole life was one of waiting for the Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. This Jesus, this living word who has died and who has risen, who is going to come again. He is the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. I believe every Christian should be able to look back a little bit and say, uh, there's a place God's word worked where I had gone a little off in idolatry. Um, sometimes that's a daily thing for me. Sometimes, uh, you know, monthly or uh, sometimes a, a moment in a year where, man, I was really kind of headed the wrong direction there. But God's Word drew me back to Jesus. That's what God's Word does. That's why we gladly hear it and we hold it sacred. God's Word turns us from idols to worship a living and true God and saves us, delivers us from the wrath to come. Paul was concerned about the Thessalonians. Maybe that tempter might tempt them away. Well, not if they are around God's Word. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, May it guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this